Now at noon, Governor Kate Brown just wrapped up a news conference. She's talking about the failed cap and trade bill and the end of the legislative session. We'll hear from the governor. Fire breaks out near Hood River as wildfire season officially starts today in Oregon. Plus, big changes for the Blazers. We'll break down the players coming and going next season. This is KGW News at noon. Let me be very, very clear. I am not backing down. That is Governor Kate Brown talking about the failed cap and trade bill. She spoke at a news conference today weighing in on Oregon's legislative session and its big flurry of work this past weekend to get the job done. Welcome to KGW News at Noon. I'm Chris Willis. Thanks as always for being with us. That marathon weekend finish was needed after a nine day walkout by Republican senators over that controversial cap and trade bill. Let's get the latest live now from KGW's Tim Gordon in Salem. And Tim, the Republicans got what they wanted. The climate bill is dead. So how's the governor feel about this session? Well, Chris, other than cap and trade, the governor is very happy with this session. I'd say ecstatic even. She cited huge victories in two of her signature issues, uh, both campaign finance reform and education, the Student Success Act that Republicans walked out the first time over, ultimately passed. And in terms of the work done in the final two days here, Brown says she is thankful to both sides for their work. It is pretty amazing legislators got as much done as they did this past weekend with votes on more than 100 bills that were still left on the table. A big one, paid family and medical leave. It gives Oregon workers 12 weeks of paid leave if they have a child or recovering from a serious illness or need to care for a family member with one. Also, lawmakers voted to put a tobacco tax increase on the 2020 ballot. Voters would decide on increasing the cigarette tax by $2 to $3.33 a pack. It would also put a tax on e-cigarettes and vaping. Also a bill to allow high-density housing in Oregon's larger cities in some neighborhoods currently allowing only single-family homes. Those are just a few. There's no doubt the governor will sign those. And when it comes to the carbon reduction and cap-and-trade plan, she says she will not give up. She will learn and collaborate more. And if she has to, she may use executive powers to make things happen. Doing nothing to reduce emissions is not an option, not for our economy, our, our communities, our environment, and of course, particularly our children. I am open to modifications, but I am not open to inaction. Yeah, despite the frustration over cap and trade, I'd say the governor seemed to be uh, in a good mood, as I said, and also relieved. There's a lot less stress around here today and now the governor can get to work signing the bills that she wants to and that'll be most of them over the next 30 days. Chris back to you. Huge busy weekend. All right Tim Gordon live in Salem. Thank you Tim and you can find more coverage on the legislative session at KGW.com or you can always go to the KGW News app. Meantime a special committee is meeting next week to look into a complaint against Republican Senator Brian Boquist. It's regarding two statements he made during the start of the walkout when the governor said she'd send state police to round up Republicans and bring them back. Boquist responded to that message with one of his own for Senate President Peter Courtney on the Senate floor. Listen. And you send the state police to get me? Hell's coming to visit you personally. <laughs> that same day, Boquist said this while talking to KGW's Pat Doris. Send bachelors and come heavily armed. I'm not going to be a political prisoner in the state of Oregon. It's just that simple. As per Senate policy, an outside law firm was called in to look at the statements. The law firm issued a memo saying the comments constitute, quote, credible threats of violence directed at the Senate president and the Oregon State Police. The law firm recommended that Senator, Senator Boquist should not be allowed to return to the Capitol. He stayed off the floor Saturday, but did return yesterday. We've, re we've reached out to him, but have not heard back. The Conduct Committee is meeting about his comments and it's scheduled for July 8th. We want to know what you think. In today's viewer voice poll, do you think there should be consequences for Senator Boquist's threatening comments? You can let us know right now at KGW.com vote or by clicking on the viewer voice tab in our KGW News app. Other news at noon, the minimum wage goes up today for 160,000 Oregon workers. It is the third in a series of six rate hikes. In Portland, employers will now have to pay at least $12.50 an hour. That's 50 cents higher than before. By the year 2022, it's expected to hit just under 15 bucks at 14.75.
All right, a lot of big news with the Blazers now. Portland has a big man now to fill in for injured Yusuf Nurkic. Miami Heat is trading center Hassan Whiteside for Mo Harkless and Myers Leonard. The Sacramento Kings originally drafted Whiteside in 2010. He joined the Heat prior to the 2014 season. Whiteside has averaged a double-double with more than 14 points and 12 boards in the past four seasons. We are hearing the Blazers react to the trade. C.J. McCollum posted on Twitter saying he's going to miss Harkless and Leonard. He says losing some great people and teammates. As for Whiteside, McCollum told him to bring his heart, bring his hard hat, and he said we've got work to do. The face of the franchise isn't going anywhere anytime soon. The Athletic was the first to report that Damian Lillard has agreed to a new four-year, $196 million contract extension. Let that sink in. The four-time All-Star still has two years remaining on his existing deal, so he'll be in a Blazers uniform for at least until the 2025 season. With their best player taken care of, the Blazers made two other moves yesterday. Resigned forward Rodney Hood, but did not resign Al Farouk Aminu, so the Chief is moving on. Art Edwards is following all the movement by the Blazers. He'll bring us more coverage coming up on KGW News at 4. A wildfire broke out last night on a small island near the Hook. That's just offshore from the port of Hood River. The Hood River County Sheriff's Office posted these photos on Facebook. Take a look. They say crews are not able to reach the fire, but it's not threatening the public. Firefighters will keep an eye on it and let it burn. We don't yet know the cause. This all comes with the official start of fire season in Northwest Oregon today. And with the weather starting to dry out and the 4th of July this week, conditions are dangerous. Christine Pitawanich live now in downtown Portland to explain. So Christine, this year there are also some changes that we need to talk about. Chris, yes, there are a couple of changes, the first of which deals with what people are allowed to do during the fire season, and the second deals with the prediction for this season. I'll start things off talking about what you can and can't do. In past years, once fire season officially started, people could only build campfires at designated campsites, but now what you're allowed to do will correspond to what fire danger level the area is experiencing. So this year, even though fire season has already started, campfires are allowed in areas outside side of those designated sites and it's not until the danger level gets to moderate that more restrictions will come into play. You can find all the restriction details on ODF's website. And as for fire season itself, the Oregon Department of Forestry spokesperson I talked to says while the rain we got last week was good, May was warm and things are drying out really fast. And the predictions for long range for June, July and August are that the west side of Oregon from Washington to California is going to be a worse fire season than eastern Oregon this summer. He says already this year in his district they've had 22 fires and that's twice the number of human caused fires they had at this time last year. Fortunately, crews have caught them early, so they've remained small. And about those fireworks for this 4th of July, remember they're banned on forest land and in some cities there are restrictions like in Portland, but in other cities like say Vancouver, those fireworks are banned outright. Back to you. All right, got to be careful out there. Christine, thank you. To the weather now, Keely Chalmers in for Rod Hill. And Keely, we're looking at some changes. You're tracking some thunder or storms tonight. Yeah, we've already got some thunderstorms flaring up in some areas of our uh, region. You can see here we got precipitation moving up from the south and the lightning strikes right there moving into Mount Bachelor indicates the yes, we are seeing some thunderstorm activity already at this noon hour. This system is going to continue to bring us active weather as we head into the afternoon and evening hours. It's also increasing clouds from the coast to the valley up into the Cascades. Here's a look at Cannon Beach right now where it is 59 degrees and it is it is cloudy. We're starting to see the clouds move back into the downtown area. 74 for a temperature right now, and uh, we are going to top out pretty close to 80 for a high, it looks like, because those clouds are going to come in and start to cool off temperatures. So here's a look at your weather headlines for today. Again, a pretty pleasant start to the day out there. Warm, just a few clouds in the mix. Then we do have another round of thunderstorms. You saw it right there in the Cascades already, and showers this afternoon extending into the early part of the evening evening as well. 4th of July, it is looking sunny and warmer, so we have a few days of wetter active. Well, actually, just today is going to be active thunderstorm wise, but then we have a couple days of cooler with some potential for some precipitation days and then back to sunshine and we're going to get up to 81 degrees. Your forecast high for the 4th of July. We'll talk more about those thunderstorms coming up in your main forecast.
Chris. All right, we'll see you in a bit, Keely. Thank you. If you take the bus or if you take the max, your fare is going to change later this summer. Mm -hmm. TriMet will stop selling mobile tickets and most paper tickets on August 6th. But you still have until December 31st to use them. So TriMet rolled out the Hop Fast Pass card back in May. It pays for rides on TriMet, C-Tran and the Portland Street car. A several hour standoff in Southeast Portland ended peacefully overnight. Crisis negotiation negotiators got an armed and suicidal man to surrender. He was in a home near 141st Avenue and Bush Street. The standoff started around midnight, ended just before 4 a.m. Police told neighbors near Powell Butte Nature Park to stay in their homes. Investigators say a woman and three children got out of the home safely. That man involved is now in custody. Right wing protesters and Antifa clashed in downtown Portland Saturday, injuring at least eight people. Police made three arrests. They also put out this tweet saying protesters were throwing milkshakes with quick drying cement in them. Protesters are denying that. One of the people attacked over the weekend was conservative writer Andy No. This video of the incident has been viewed nearly 10 million times. Look at that. No word on whether any of No's attackers were arrested or charged. President Trump back at the White House after an historic visit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Both agreed to revive talks on North Korea's nuclear program. Here's more now from NBC's Richard Engel. Well, we know President Trump enjoyed his impromptu summit with Kim Jong-un in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. But until now, we didn't know what the North Koreans actually thought. But they just released a propaganda video, and unlike a lot of North Korean propaganda, which is very aggressive toward the United States, often very threatening, this one was absolutely gushing, praising the meeting, showing Kim Jong-un, escorting President Trump across the demarcation line that separates North and South Korea, showing him as a gracious host. The video described the meeting as going beyond expectations, that it shocked and moved the world. An accompanying article said that it was as if a mysterious force was bringing these two leaders together and driving good relations, that there was now an opportunity to rewrite history and start a new chapter. So this was an absolute ringing endorsement of this meeting, but critics say that President Trump was simply coddling a tyrant, using this for a photo op, for a campaign endorsement for himself, and that North Korea hasn't actually taken any real steps to slow down or reduce its nuclear program. Richard Engel, NBC News, Seoul. All right, coming up, a simple treatment could be the future of treatment for PTSD. We're going to explain how that works. Also, there's a new warning when it comes to vitamin D, how a deficiency could impact your health later on in life. Plus, we're tracking wild weather in Mexico. Look at this damage left behind from a hailstorm. There it is. Look at that. That's a hailstorm from Guadalajara. Details after the break.